So I'd like to end chapter three of the elements of computing systems with the final RAM module. It's a RAM 16K module. And um, I was building these RAM modules pretty much as the book had indicated, uh, you know, recursively increasing the amount of RAM in each implementation. I did it two or three times. At the end of that, I got up to RAM 64 or something. And Logisim was really starting to bog down. It was one problem. Every time you'd insert that module, it would take a long time to render because of the number of gates that, you know, as continues to expand geometrically as you uh, continue to build it out. Uh, and so Logisim was having a hard time with it. And then secondly, when I would, you know, I was curious how they would, how the design would actually be synthesized on the hardware, figuring that it was probably going to use distributed logic because of the way the design, you know, was being built. It was being built out of discrete flip-flops and, and so forth. And sure enough, when I looked at the the log, and it's in one of those videos, uh, the log showed that, you know, many thousands of the uh, of the footprint were being used for just basically implementing memory. And it wasn't that much memory. So uh, I knew that uh, Logisim had, or has, if we go look here under memory, Logisim has a RAM implementation module. And so I wondered whether or not that module was optimized to take advantage of block RAM that many FPGAs have in them. And not really familiar enough with how you get the synthesizer to to do that. Uh, I did some did some research and decided that um, I would go ahead and build out the remaining RAM modules uh, for the uh, hack CPU based on this RAM module inside uh, Logisim to see what the result would be. And uh, it's got pretty good results. Uh, so here's the user interface for the RAM module. It's no different than all the other ones we've been building. Just now supports uh, 14 bits of addressing, which gets you the full 16K. And so the design, let's go look at the design here. The design sort of looks like this, which conceptually is similar to the way I've been doing the design for the other, you know, smaller RAM modules. So I'll walk through it. Basically the load determines which of the banks a data input value would get loaded into. And that load is uh, run through a demuxer. And the demuxer is based upon the last two bits of the address because that's, you know, for the RAM 16K module, uh, we are implementing it as four, four 4K banks. And the last two bits dictate which of the four banks the value is going to be put into as demultiplex by this demultiplexer. Data in basically just goes to all the data ends. It doesn't have to be gated in any way because any only one of these is going to get loaded at, an, at any given time according to the address uh, down here. So data in can just go to all the data ends of the, of the banks. Same with the clock. We all clock these the same. Uh, and so same as the address in, at least the lower uh, 12 bits of it because uh, 12 bits covers a given 4K module. So the splitter splits those bottom 12 bits, puts them into the address in, and then of course the other two get routed to the load to multiplexer, but also over to the output multiplexer to determine which bank of the output we're going to put two out of the module. So that's basically the implementation. And I did this implementation for the 4K module and I think the 512 module. And I did it offline because it was it was a lot the same of what I was doing with the smaller ones. It was just with the memory module, which I guess maybe that might be worth a quick peek. Uh, so I started with RAM 512. Uh, and this is how the memory modules for from Logisim have to be implemented. So we can talk about this quickly. Uh, each of these modules uh, has a write enable, has an address in, uh, sorry, has a, uh, yeah, has an address in, uh, has a uh, data in and a data 
out, although you can change the implementation to have just one bus that does both in and out. But I thought this was easier to sort of conceptualize, so I implemented it this way. Again, you have clocks, so the, all the clocks are wired together. All of the data ends, so this, so, so this is the data ends, this is the address ends, so all the data ends are wired together. Again, conceptually similar to how we do it, you know, in the 16K module that we just looked at. Um, but what is different is that the data in is split in two because it's a 16-bit input. These modules are only 8 bits, though, so we need to double up these modules in order to form a 16-bit input. They're 256, essentially, bytes, uh, and we need, the, we need 256 words, which is what these two provide. And since this is a, five, a RAM 512, we need two of these things, in essence, so that, you know, that now gets us 512 16-bit words of storage. The address is done similar again to the 16K module, but for the 512 bytes, the bottom, yeah, the bottom eight bits, which form a, six, a 256 bit, or which form 256 memory locations, if you will, that, that bottom eight get wired to the address in. So that's what the splitter is splitting apart. The last bit determines which of these two banks the value is going to go uh, into on load or out upon the output side. You know, write enable is basically the same as load. There is, there was a um, output enable. If you, if you, by default, when you drop these modules on here, the enables property is set to use byte enables. Uh, but I just decided it was easier to use line enables. Output basically just comes out all the time because I'm, muxing the output anyway. So that just made it more straightforward. But by virtue then of using these modules, as opposed to using discrete um, flip-flops, what that gives you, I saved the synthesis log. And so if we scroll down here, there's a bunch of stuff in here, bear with me. But if you look at the component info right here, what you'll notice is the number of discrete components used is relatively low. So 259 registers, whatever. The, the RAM 64, I think it was, the number of registers, you know, these, these numbers were out of sight, like in the, in the thousands. Uh, I think 10,000. I can't really remember, but it was a lot. Um, but also in that design, the RAM, the RAM 64 design, there were no... RAMs or block RAMs in use. In this design, however, we can see that there's 128 block RAMs in in use, and that is because of the way the that um, Logisim implements the RAM component. And in particular, let's take a look at that because you know the question that I had in my mind is, well, what do you have to do to make the synthesizer know that that's what your intention is? And there are a couple of ways, as I've later read, there are a couple of ways to do it. But the way that Logisim do, does it is actually pretty, I, I think, pretty straightforward because that's the way the synthesizers know to interpret it. And so what we're looking at here is the VHDL that was generated from Logisim that ultimately gets sent to, to Vivado. And in particular, uh, the, uh, well, the entity defines the inputs and the outputs of the RAM module. And you'll notice we have four of them, four RAM modules, which correspond to the RAM in the uh, RAM 512 component that we just looked at. Of course, that component is replicated several times to get to a RAM 16K module because there's a RAM 512 and then a RAM 4K and then a RAM 16K. But under the covers, RAM 16K ultimately implements these four RAM modules from uh, Logisim. So this is the entity, and then the behavior. Uh, again, if you don't know VHDL, sort of looks like programming language. It's not really programming language in the traditional sense. It's, it's hardware definition. This stuff is rather unimportant. What really is important, I believe, is this line right here. And that line basically forms a 2D array of 256 slots with 8 bits in each slot, but forming a chunk or a block of memory. And I, I believe 
at least Vivado and probably all the rest of the synthesis tools, not really sure, but Vivado certainly probably looks at that and says, ah, that looks like memory. And I, that's pro- if, if I were to guess, that is probably how it infers or inferences the fact that you want to use block RAM and it'll stick this, mm, it'll, it'll take this definition and find a spot in block memory to put it. Now, what I am aware of is that the block memory is implemented differently in different chips and the amount in each chunk can vary. Uh, I think in, with the Arctic 7, it's 9K and 18K or 18K and 36K. I, I can't really remember um, how it's broken up. And what I also don't know, and it wasn't really clear from the log, at least I couldn't really make this out. It says it says 2K, which is right, 256 by 8. That's what we did. And it implemented 128 block RAMs. Which, uh, so what what makes me confused, at least, is that if you look at part resources, you know, it, it says that there's 60 RAM block 18s and 30 RAM block 36s. Oh, okay. And that's where I got the 18 and 36 from. So, yeah. So uh, the Arctic 7 chip implements a RAM, a block RAM 18K and a block RAM 36K uh, primitive. And so seems to me like it's not filling up the block RAM according to the primitives, like it's wasting it. I, I'm not really 100% sure about that. It, you know, those in the comments, if you can answer that question for me, um, I would appreciate it. Whatever the case, it did synthesize correctly and it did run. So it didn't give me an error. But what it, what it leads me to is, I think it sure would be nice if there was a way that Logisim would allow you to parameterize this so that you could create your own memory array of whatever size best suits the capability of your chip uh, so that, you know, you could say, okay, I want, you know, I want 256 spots and I want 16 bits or whatever. And then those parameters would basically just get directly passed in here. Of course, these things would have to change as well to accommodate, you know, a change in the number of, uh, bits in your, uh, in your byte or your word or whatever. But uh, I think, you know, it, it, it would definitely make this a whole lot more flexible and less, I think, wasteful of the resources in your, in your FPGA. Uh, but all that said, I think we're on our way to get to the next chapter, um, to start on the CPU because, uh, all of the components, uh, have been built and are operational. Thanks for watching.